Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, I'm having internet connection issues. Sorry for being late. So if the connection dies, just wait for me to log in. You might need to log in, I don't know. Uh, but uh, hopefully everything will work all right. All right, are there any questions? If not, let's begin. I know we're working on chapter eight today. Did anyone have trouble with uh, the quiz? No. All right. So we were talking about the lac operon. And I think we had talked about all of this slide. We're in the lac operon. You uh, have the operon that's inducible, and it's normally turned off because the, another gene, the repressor gene, makes a repressor protein that binds to the operator, turning off the lac operon. However, when the sugar lactose is around, allolactose is also around because they're isomers, and allolactose binds to the repressor protein, inactivating it, and that will turn on the lac operon. When the lac operon is turned on, the promoter will bind, I mean the, uh, excuse me, not the promoter, the RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter and then move down the DNA, transcribing the lactase gene, the Z, the permease gene, the Y gene, and then the uh, transacetylase, which is the uh, um, gene that, uh, helps convert beta-galactose into glucose. Uh, the permease is another name for the uh, channel protein or transport protein that brings the sugar lactose across the cell membrane. Any question about any of that? Okay. And then I also mentioned that with the lac operon, it's unusual then when we make one messenger RNA, three proteins are transcribed from that one messenger RNA. And in bacterial messenger RNAs, this can happen. In a eukaryote, there's only one structural gene on an operon. All right, any question about any of that? If not, let's go ahead and uh, view this movie on the lac operon. We might get a commercial to start with. No? I'm turning it down at the start. The E. coli lac operon is an example of an inducible set of genes. These genes are responsible for the breakdown of lactose into sugars used for cellular metabolism. This inducible system also involves bacterial DNA, a repressor, mRNA, and the sugar molecule lactose. This animation will only focus on two of the three proteins encoded by the lac operon, beta-galactosidase and permease. 
Gene expression can be induced or turned on when a specific inducer molecule appears in a cell. For inducible systems, a repressor molecule prevents gene expression by binding to the upstream controlling region. Lactose is the lac operon inducer molecule. After first appearing in the cellular environment, lactose passively enters the E. coli cell and binds to the repressor molecule. This binding releases the repressor from the controlling region. At this point, RNA polymerase can begin transcription of the operon. Here we show two of the three lac operon genes being transcribed into mRNA. Ribosomes then bind to the mRNA and the two proteins are translated. The first protein is beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into two simple sugars. The second protein is permease, a membrane-bound protein. When embedded in the cell membrane, permease functions to provide a direct route for the lactose outside the cell to be imported into the cell. This import occurs at a much greater rate than the passive transfer we first observed. Because translation continues inside the cell, other permease proteins become embedded in the membrane. This further increases the rate at which lactose enters the cell. Beta-galactosidase breaks the cellular lactose into the simple sugars glucose and galactose. Once its concentration is greatly reduced, the lactose bound to the repressor are released. At this point, the repressor again binds to the controlling region and gene expression is halted. For all inducible systems like the lac operon, it is the interaction of the repressor and inducer molecules that mediate gene expression. All right, any questions about the video? All right, so let's move on to mutation. Mutation is a change in the genetic material. Mutations be, can be neutral, meaning they don't give any benefit or harm the individual. Uh, they may be beneficial or they may be harmful. Uh, here's an example of a mutation where this person has normal eye color blue and there is a mutation where they don't have the normal eye color. That's unusual uh, coloration, actually. Uh, mutagens are agents that cause mutations, or you can say they increase the mutation rate. Uh, everybody knows that uh, cigarette smoke is a mutagen, and it's an agent that just causes mutations. You should realize that mutations do occur on their own. These we call spontaneous mutations. They occur in the absence of a mutagen. Uh, usually how a spontaneous mutation occurs is the DNA polymerase just makes a mistake when it's replicating the DNA. There are different types of mutations. A base substitution, also called a point mutation, can be a silent mutation, a missense mutation, and a nonsense mutation. And we'll talk about each of these three in later slides. Anyways, with a base substitution, one nucleotide base is altered in the DNA, why it's called a point mutation. Any questions about any of that? There's also a frame shift mutation, and that is when an extra base, whoops, didn't mean to do that, I'm trying to blow this up, is when an extra base is inserted in the DNA, or an extra base, or not an extra base, a base is removed from the DNA, or a multiple of that. Now, it's a frame shift mutation when you add an extra base or you remove an extra base, because if you remember the codons in messenger RNA are pairs of three. And if you add an extra base, you, shift, you uh, 
alter the codon rating. So you add an extra base, not only will the amino acid in that region be altered, but all amino acids after that point will be altered because the codon reading is shifted. Any questions about a frame shift mutation? Now, a complication of a frame shift mutation is if you have three additional nucleotides added or three removed, it's not a frame shift mutation because you're only altering if you're you if you add three nucleotide bases, you only change that one base. You're adding a new base there. All the other proteins in the that are coded for in the DNA will be read correctly. Okay, meaning you don't change the frame. So the frame shift is not shifted. Everybody get that? So a frame shift is what? Uh, an addition of one or two or four or five additional nucleotides or minus one or two or four or five nucleotides. But if it's a change of three, it's not a frame shift mutation because the frame is not changed. Any questions about that? I know that's I have, a little complex. I have a question. Uh huh. So what if it's three, but it comes in after say the first two, so it changes two different nucleotides, then would it be considered frame shift with only three? Uh, no, um, it doesn't change two nucleotides. Now, are you adding three additional nucleotides? Or it, yeah, if you in add the third like, position. So the first two, the first two codons will be coding correctly. So the first two amino acids will be correct. Then we'll have a third new amino acid, which will be altered because it's new. But then the fourth amino acid is the same as the third amino acid would have been. So it's not a frame shift mutation. You got that? Yeah. All right, good. And then there's a macro mutation. And I want to warn you that the macro mutation is not discussed in the book. I don't know why it's not, but it's not discussed in the textbook. A macro mutation is where an entire region of a chromosome is either added or deleted. And it may be the entire chromosome that is either added or deleted. That is a macro mutation. So an entire region of a chromosome, I uh, used to know, uh, what the heck is that? child is born and makes the crying sound of a cat and I forgot the name of that disease uh, it's part of the chromosome is missing and that's a macro mutation another macro mutation that I think everyone is familiar with is down syndrome where an individual is born with an extra chromosome 23 okay that's a macro mutation All right, any question about the three types of mutations? Uh, here's a picture of a boy they were testing to see if he was a mutant, because if you notice, spoons are attracted to his skin. And they were wondering, is he a magneto? And some people just wondered if maybe his mutation made his skin sticky and then the spoons are just sticking to his skin. And I was reading about this, but I never read on what the study, meaning that they were going to study him, but they never, I never saw the article discuss what the study found. So um, I don't know the answer to that. But maybe he's a Magneto, if you know, what is it, the X-Men series. Uh, a point mutation is where a nucleotide base is changed in uh, 
DNA replication, a T is put here when a C should have been put here. And that will, with further replication, because the T then will be replicated into an A, and then that A will be replicated into a T. And so when replication occurs on top of an error, you fix the mutation. When the mutation has not been replicated, like right here, it's always possible that the DNA can be repaired, that the, the host can actually recognize this because the T and the G do not bind. And then it'll recognize that there's a mistake made right here. And the DNA always replaces the new, newly replicated strand. So the T will be removed and then the C will be put in. We're not gonna talk about uh, DNA repair, but that is what happens. And we're not gonna talk about how the host knows this is the new one and that's the old strand, but the host has a means of knowing which one's the old one and which one's the new strand. And until this gets replicated, it can be repaired, okay? But once it's replicated, this mutation then becomes fixed in this cell. Of course, this strand being replicated on the G will actually replicate normally. So this cell will be correct, but this cell will be permanently a mutation. Any question about that? And you can see the point mutation, which should have been, uh, UGU, which would be the messenger RNA, but it should have been, will be changed to UAU, changing this amino acid, which I don't know if I've got that on there. Yeah, it changes the amino acid from cysteine to tyrosine. Any question about any of that? So this is a base substitution mutation, a point mutation. And it is also a uh, missense mutation because it's changing the amino acid. Okay. If the uh, uh, codon change would have coded for the same amino acid, we call that a silent mutation. Meaning if uh, UUU is changed to UUC, it still codes for the amino acid phenylalanine. The protein is not changed. The DNA is changed. The nucleotide is changed in the DNA, but the amino acid is not changed in the protein. So we call this a silent mutation. It has no effect on the protein function. Any question about any of that? And that's why it's called a silent mutation because it is a mutation, but it doesn't change the protein. A missense mutation I've already talked about is where you change the nucleotide base and we're changing it. Looks like we're changing it here, not there. I don't know why the arrow is there. So it's CG, CCG, which would be GGC and it's changed to GCU. No, it's changed to AGC, sorry. And that changes the amino acid in the protein. And this is called a missense mutation. An example of a missense mutation is sickle cell anemia, where one amino acid is changed in the protein. And there are thousands of amino acids in hemoglobin. And if you only change one of them, I forget which number, it's either the fifth or the sixth amino acid, you change it and then the protein doesn't work as well. And we call that sickle cell anemia. 
of course, the individual needs two of those genes to have that mutation expressed because this mutation is mostly recessive. Any question about any of that? Another missense mutation happened in the human population 10,000 years ago. And it happened in Northern Europe. 10,000 years ago, humans only had the brown eyed allele. And then we had a mutation in the human population resulting in the blue eyed allele. And for whatever reason, the bluish eyed allele became the predominant allele in Northern Europe. When we look at this today, the blue eyed allele is a neutral mutation, meaning it doesn't benefit the individual from compared to the brown eyed allele. However, in the past, it may have given a benefit to humans. And that would be why it became the predominant allele in Northern Europe. It's also possible that the blue eyed allele happened to be right next to another gene, which gave a benefit. And then the two got selected together. But for whatever reason, the blue eyed allele increased in frequency, especially in Northern Europe. And now humans have two main eye color genes and we'll call them the brownish eye allele and the bluish eyed allele. And all humans can be broken down into either bluish eyes or brownish eyes. Uh, the other eye colors, the different shades are of different genes which have a minor effect on giving a variation of blue or a variation of brownish. For example, green eyed, that still is the blue eyed allele, but there is at least one other gene which changes the shade from blue to green. Any questions about the blue eyed allele and how it uh, 10,000 years ago was a missense mutation. Now, the other question is, in the future, may we have another missense mutation resulting in a third eye color? If you don't know, dogs have at least three eye colors. They have brownish eyes, they have bluish eyes, and they have yellow eyes. So it's possible in the future, humans could have another color of eyes. There is also a nonsense mutation is when you change the nucleotide from AAG, for example, to UAG. A uh, nonsense mutation is this one because the amino acid is changed to the stop codon. And this is called a nonsense mutation. The, the protein up until the stop codon will be coded correctly. But after the stop codon, there is no more protein. So the protein is truncated after the nonsense mutation. And this can result in a shorter protein. The protein usually will not function as well if it functions at all. And oftentimes the protein doesn't function at all because it's just missing too many amino acids. And it really will depend, does this happen at the end of the gene or does it happen near the beginning of the gene? If it happens near the end of the gene, the, uh, the gene may still function, but if it happens near the beginning of the gene, the gene probably is not gonna function. An example of a nonsense mutation 
are some muscular dystrophy patients and some cystic fibrosis patients have a nonsense mutation where the amino acid that was once coded is changed to a nonsense mutation and the codon now codes for the stop mutation, not the stop, the stop codon. Any question about any of that? All right, I've already talked about frame, sh frame shift mutation. That's when you insert or delete one or more bases. And I mentioned that if you insert or delete a multiple of three, it's not a frame shift. A frame shift is when you, in this case, we've removed a base. And so instead of U, 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 it then will be U, U. And then it grabs the next codon, which is a G. And that will change this amino acid and all further amino acids in the protein after this. Any question about that? Some Tay-Sachs patients are actually frame shift mutations. Not all of them, but some of them. When we're talking about mutations, it's important to realize that mutations can have one of two causes. So there are two possible causes of the mutation. The mutation can be spontaneous, where it just happens on its own, a mistake gets made in the replication of DNA, and that we call spontaneous mutation. The mutation can also be caused by a mutagen, increasing the rate of the spontaneous mutation, and we just call it increasing the rate of the mutation. There are two types of mutagens. There's radiation and there's chemical mutagens. Our radiation is electromagnetic magnetic waves. So it's a physical agent that goes in and changes the DNA. Uh, a chemical is a chemical agent which interferes or interacts with the DNA and changes it. There are two types of radiation, ionizing radiation like X-rays and gamma rays. These are uh, highly reactive radiation with a lot of energy. And when that energy in the form of ionizing radiation hits the atom, the energy will be absorbed by the electron and that energy will uh, give that electron enough energy to escape the atom. You can just say the energy hits the electron and then that uh, electron is shoved out of orbit. But another way of saying it is it gives that electron enough energy to escape the atom. This now is a, uh, is a uh, ion which can then react to DNA and it likes to replace that electron. And if this atom bumps into whatever it bumps into, it generally will steal an electron, damaging that molecule. And if it bumps into DNA, you will mutate the DNA. OK? And we're not going to talk about, uh, you can repair the DNA. We're not going to talk about that. The second form of radiation that can damage DNA is by non-ionizing radiation. An example, and as far as I know, the only example of non-ionizing radiation is UV radiation. When UV light hits DNA, and that'd be like your cells, and then it gets through the cell and hits the DNA, the UV is absorbed by thymine and then changes two thymines next to each other. The two thymines will form a covalent bond between them, and that we call a thymine dimer. 
And that causes a bubble in the DNA, meaning this DNA is not going to align correctly. There's a bubble in it. And then these two T's and the thymine dimer will not hydrogen bond to the A's in the corollary, corollary strand of DNA. This thymine dimer cannot be replicated or transcribed. And that's why it causes a mutation. This region here in the DNA is damaged. And the only way uh, the damage can be reversed is by DNA repair. You can repair this region. We're not going to talk about it. And then replace it. And that would be repairing it. Any question about any of that? The point is ionizing radiation changes the DNA in a different way. It hits the DNA and causes an electron to leave. And then that uh, DNA is uh, damaged. Uh, UV radiation, on the other hand, only damages two thymines next to each other, causing the thymine dimer. And that damages the DNA. And like I said, this is mutated in the sense that this DNA region right here cannot be uh, replicated or transcribed. All right, I think this slide is talking about chemical mutagenesis. And we're talking about how nitrous acid acts as a mutagen. Nitrous acid is a mutagen, and when it uh, interacts with DNA, the nitrous acid changes an A so that this A no longer binds to the T. And this A here is going to act like a G. And so when this is being, this strand of DNA is being replicated, the DNA polymerase will see this changed A, uh, a and think it is a G. And so it'll put a C there. And then when this gets replicated further, this mutation is fixed. It cannot be altered anymore. Is that right? Cannot be altered. Uh, at this point, it is possible to repair this, that A could be removed, and then the correct nucleotide inserted, which would be the A. So DNA can repair this as long as it's repaired before DNA replication. But after DNA replication happens, this becomes fixed. That C cannot be repaired. OK. Any question about any of that? Anyways, that's the way nitrous acid acts as a mutagen. It alters the DNA, causing that A to be red as a G. So the A is actually acting. It, I don't know how it's exactly changed, but it's changed in a way that it now acts like a G. Any questions about any of that? All right. The spontaneous mutation rate is for every base that is replicated, out of 10 to the ninth bases that are replicated, there will be a mistake. So the DNA polymerase will make one mistake in 10 to the ninth bases that it replicates. And this is the spontaneous mutation rate. Now, because your average gene has about a thousand bases in it. That means the mutation rate per gene is about one gene will be mutated in 10 to the six genes. 
or one in a million genes will be replicated. Now, if you look at the human population, we're way over a million. Does anyone remember what the human population is? I think we're something like seven or eight billion. So every once in a while, a child will be born that is a mutant. And we're only looking at one gene here. Any questions about that? All right. So that's the spontaneous mutation rate. Mutagens increase the mutation rate. They increase the mutation rate from 10 to about a thousand times. That means that in the genes that are replicated, uh, mutated, there will be one mutation from uh, 10 to the fifth genes down to one mutation in 10 to the three genes. Any question about that? So a chemical mutagen or a physical mutagen, meaning radiation, really does increase the mutation rate. Instead of being one gene in a million, it'll be one in, what is that, 100,000 or higher. Any question about any of that? Well, how do you identify a mutant? If you were to see somebody walking down the street like that, you would say, yep, that's a mutant. And that is positive direct selection for determining that this is a mutation. Uh, to test for a mutant, a positive direct selection is where you can detect the mutant cells because they grow or appear differently. And this individual sure appears different. A negative or indirect selection is where you detect a mutant cell because they do not grow. And that's an indirect or negative selection that means for detecting mutation. Let me talk a little bit more about negative selection. I once did this when I was a student. And that is you have a bunch of colonies on a plate and they're just growing on a regular auger, auger plate and they're gotta be spaced out. And we're just gonna say you get a plate like that. And then you get a velvet stamp like this and you press it into the plate that puts the cells from these colonies on the velvet. And then you stamp the velvet onto other plates. And so the cells from this colony, what is it? Uh, that colony there probably will then be stamped onto this plate and to that plate. A negative selection is where the cells do not grow on this media, but they do grow on this media. Now, why they're not growing on this media is because the mutation stops the abilities in this case to make the amino acid histidine. And this amino acid is not in this media, but in this me media, the amino acid histidine is in the media. And so the cells right here can grow and form a colony. And this is negative selection for a mutant. Uh, we know this, the cells in this colony are mutant because they're not growing here. Any question about any of that? Any confusion about any of that? All right, let's move on to genetic recombination. Recombination is the exchange of genes between two DNA molecules. So the genes are moving from one chromosome to another. And usually this happens on the uh, pair of the chromosome. 
meaning uh, women have uh, two X chromosomes and the X chromosomes can recombine. And that would be recombination. Uh, one X chromosome from the father, we'll make it the lowercase alleles and the uh, blue and gray. And then the chromosome B from the mother, it's still an X chromosome and it has the capital alleles on it, which are different shades of gray. And the chromosomes, when they pair up, can actually cross over. And then this part of the father's chromosome breaks off of the father's chromosome and then crosses over with the mother's chromosome. And so now here's the father's chromosome, capital E, capital E, capital G, and then it has part of the mother's chromosome, lowercase h, lowercase i. Like I said, this happens all the time in uh, the chromosomes which uh, pair, meaning if they're the same number or the same type, like in women, it would happen on the two X chromosomes where they can recombine, okay? Now, usually in males, the X and the Y do not recombine. However, uh, the first chromosome from the father and the first, I guess that would be the first chromosome from the father and the first chromosome from the mother can recombine in both boys and girls. So that's what recombination is, the exchange of genes between two DNA molecules. And then I mentioned what crossing over is when two DNA molecules cross over and then break and recombine. Now, does anyone notice a difference between recombination and crossing over? Hello? The way I asked the question, it's either a yes or a no. Is anyone there? Yes. Okay. Um, there is a difference between recombination and crossing over, and that is crossing over is more specific. It's referring to when the two DNA molecules cross over and break and then recombine. Recombination is a little more general. It's just an exchange of genes between two chromosomes. So does that mean recombination could occur between cells, but crossing over can't? That would be one way to look at it. Okay. Yeah, crossing over has to occur within the cell. Uh, recombination does not. It can have the DNA come into the cell. And then recombination can be like, oh, one region of a chromosome breaks off and joins another chromosome. So there is no crossing over and there is no exchange from like the mother's chromosome moving to the father and the father's moving to the mother. It's just one piece of one chromosome recombines with another chromosome. So recombination is a little more general than okay, crossing thank over. You. you got that? But most of the time, they are the same thing. So most of the time when our cells recombine, it's because they crossed over. All right. But sometimes we can have recombination without crossing over. Not very often, but sometimes. So they are slightly different things, recombination and crossing over. Oh, I guess I should talk about the importance of crossing over. Uh, the importance of, not crossing over, the importance of recombination. Recombination does not create new genes, new genetic information. Recombination does not create new genetic information. 
However, it can reshuffle the genes in the population, bringing new alleles together by recombination. For example, the blue-eyed allele was, uh, what do you call it, aligned with the blonde-haired allele. And nowadays, those have recombined, and you can have blue eyes and brown hair, or blue eyes and black hair. But initially, they were uh, together. Any question about any of that? And what happened is they just recombined. And now the, the human population has people that have uh, all cuts color hair with all types of color eyes by recombination. And so recombination brings new gene pairs together. Any question about any of that? Uh, then I guess I should mention, so how does a population get new genetic information? The only way a population can get new genetic information that doesn't exist in the species is by mutation. If the gene does not exist someplace in the species, the only way that the species or the population can get new genetic variation is by mutation. But once mutation causes it, recombination can uh, shuffle up the genes and allow you to have different gene combinations. Now, if the gene exists in the population, then, and not, not in the population, if, if the gene exists in the species, then the population can get the gene by one of two ways. There's vertical gene transfer, and that would be spontaneous mutation. A mutation happens in the parents, and then the offspring is mutated. And this is by vertical gene transfer. During reproduction, uh, the parent sends their DNA to the offspring. But uh, the, new pop, the new genetic information may move into the population by horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer can occur in one of three ways. It happens when genes transfer between cells of the same generation. So genetic information leaves a donor cell and then enters a recipient cell. This can happen by transformation, conjugation, and transduction. The three ways that horizontal gene transfer can happen. So let's say the gene exists in the population a new cell can get that gene by transformation. Transformation happens, the DNA moves out of the donor cell, probably because the donor cell died, and then the DNA is in the environment, and then the DNA is taken up by the recipient cell. And then a part of that DNA recombines with the chromosome And then this cell can pick up new genetic information. The lowercase a gene came from the DNA that this cell took up. And we're not gonna talk about it, but uh, the uh, lowercase a gene replaced the uppercase a gene. So you have to have a combination of the new DNA with the chromosome. This can transform the cell, meaning change the phenotype of this cell. For example, if the lowercase a gene 
coded for like ampicillin resistance, this cell will now pick up ampicillin resistance, the gene for it. And if A is expressed, the cell will be ampicillin resistant. Any question about any of that? The point is this cell picked up new existing genetic variation that the cell did not have before. And it picked it up from DNA that did exist in the species. Any question about that? Transformation is actually used in a molecular biology lab all the time where people add DNA to cells and the recipient cell takes it up. We're not going to talk any further about that, but there are ways to make it so that this cell is more likely to take up this DNA. And I think that's a chapter that we don't have any assigned reading in, but if you wanted to read it, I think it's chapter nine. Now I mentioned that transformation is the taking up of DNA and then the expression of that DNA and then the changing the phenotype of this cell. So transformation can be used in two ways. The process shown here, and then the change in phenotype from this phenotype to that phenotype is also called transformation. And we'll use them somewhat interchangeably, but uh, I'll try and talk about the process as transformation. And we won't talk about changing the phenotype as transformation. Any question about any of that? All right, conjugation is where one cell, the F plus cell, sorry, that cell, uh, sends DNA from the F plus cell to the F minus cell. And this happens with gram negatives through the sex pilus. It can happen in gram positives and it happens with a mating bridge. When a mating bridge happens, two gram-positive cells come together, and then the, the uh, cell membrane of this cell fuses with the cell membrane of that cell. And when that happens, you'll notice the cell membranes going around here, and then around here, and then around here, and there, so that the cytoplasm of this cell is connected to the cytoplasm of that cell. That can allow a plasmid to move from one cell to another cell. We're not gonna talk much about the mating bridge, but my point is, is that in gram positives, uh, conjugation, also called sexual conjugation, can occur through the mating bridge. With gram negatives, it happens with the sex pilus. We've talked about the sex pilus before. The sex pilus has a plasmid, which is called the F plasmid. And this plasmid has a gene that encodes for the sex pilus, the structure there. The sex pilus actually goes and skewers an F minus cell and then acts as a winch to bring the two cells closer together. Now the two cells don't have to come this close, meaning right next to each other, because the sex pilus is hollow and the plasmid can leave the F plus cell and then move into the F minus cell through the sex pilus, which is shown here. And I haven't mentioned it, but you have to have the, uh, the F plasmid replicate, and it does replicate independent of the chromosome. And when it replicates, then uh, a copy of it can move through the 
sex pilus into the F minus cell. Now this F minus cell now has the F plasmid in it. As I mentioned, the F plasmid contains the gene for making the sex pilus. So this F minus cell will grow a sex pilus and then will act as an F plus cell. So in a sense, uh, the F minus cell is transformed into an F plus cell. And then this F plus cell can skewer an F minus cell with its X, with its F pilus, sex pilus, and uh, engage in sexual conjugation with the uh, uh, F minus cell, transforming it into an F plus cell. Anyways, here is where we're talking about the phenotype changing from F minus to F plus. And it is correct to use the word transformation, although I won't in the future use that word because I'll just use transformation only to talk about the process of this cell taking up DNA and then being converted. But simply the change in the phenotype, you can use that word to say that this cell is transformed into the F plus cell. Any question about that? All right. The third way that a cell can pick up new genetic information that exists in the species is by transduction. Transduction uses a virus. And we haven't talked about viruses yet. So let me briefly talk about a lytic virus. What happens is we have a virus which can infect this cell. And when it does, it injects its DNA into this cell. Let me blow that up a little. And one of the first things that the DNA of the virus does is it degrades the host DNA. Now, why does it degrade the host DNA? Because the viral DNA, that's the phage DNA there, wants to run the shots in the cell once it infects the cell. And an easy way to run the shots is to destroy the host DNA. And then your DNA is calling all the shots in the cell. And what the virus DNA wants to do is replicate the virus. So it will replicate the viral DNA shown in purple here, or reddish purple, I guess we could call it. I'm gonna call that red, although it's reddish purple. And then the host DNA cut into pieces is purple or bluish purple. Uh, another thing the uh, viral DNA does is it makes more viral protein. And then the viral replicated DNA gets together with the newly made viral protein to make new viruses. And then the last thing a lytic virus does is it lyses this cell to release the newly replicated viruses. But viruses make a mistake every once in a while and they have lots of offspring so they're not worried about making a mistake. So they make mistakes more frequently than like eukaryotic cells and even bacterial cells for that matter. And occasionally a mistake is made like that cell there, which is not shown very clearly. Let me blow that up a little further. This uh, uh, virus here did not get the reddish purple viral DNA inserted into it. What got inserted in is part of the host chromosome. 
the blue purple. Now this virus here will replicate like a normal virus, the same as I've discussed. But this one, let's talk about it. When this virus now infects another cell, it will inject the DNA in the virus into the cell. But this is not viral DNA. This is DNA from this cell. And then that DNA can recombine with the chromosomes where this cell now picks up new DNA that the cell did not have before. And its DNA comes from this cell. If this DNA contains the gene for ampicillin resistant, then this cell will become ampicillin resistant. And this is the third way that cells can pick up DNA that exists in the population by transduction using a virus. In prokaryotic cells, you can see where this would happen. And it does happen all the time. Um, but in humans, it doesn't happen very often, at least in the human germline, meaning where a virus picks up DNA from a germ cell and then infects a germ cell and then injects that into the germline cell. But if we were to look at the no cells of people, uh, this probably happens in our nose cells all the time, where the first virus picks up DNA or lyses the, infects a nose cell and, and degrades the DNA, and then a mistake gets made, and then this virus gets the DNA from this nose cell, and then that nose cell DNA is injected into this cell here, meaning the virus has moved on to another patient. And this nose cell got DNA from the cell of this patient. Okay. However, although this probably happens all the time, who cares? Because one cell of the nose of one person now has some DNA of this person. Uh, this will not be passed on to the offspring. And it's only one nose cell out of, I don't know how many nose cells a person has, but let's say many. And it, it does have the gene, one gene of, of this cell, but, but uh, like I said, this probably does happen in human nose cells, but it doesn't happen very often in the human germline. Any question about any of that? Well, how important are uh, transformation in bacteria, sexual conjugation, and transduction? Let me see if I can open a window here. Ah, this will be good enough. All right, we've already mentioned that mutation, whoops, let's blow this up. Mutation happens one time in one times 10, to the six cells. And I don't know if I can do that here. So I'm just gonna go EE6. Hopefully you guys are familiar with that. If you're not, this is a sub superscript six. So one in a million. And that's the trouble with WordPad. I don't know if I can do, oh, here it is. Never mind, I just found it.
No, I just lost it. Where the heck is that? There it is. Okay, so this is spontaneous mutation. Let's go over here and put it there. SP for spontaneous mutation. Um, transformation. Let me blow that up. Transformation. happens about one in 10 to the fifth, or 10 times more frequently. And sexual conjugation which we'll call conjugation, conjugation happens the same. that wrong. And transduction ah. is the same uh, same frequency, meaning that each of these happen 10 times more commonly than spontaneous mutation. Any question about any of that? And we're talking about in a bacterial population. So if you have a new mutation and it already exists in the, pop, uh, in the species, then you're most likely going to get it by transformation, conjugation, and transduction rather than spontaneous mutation. However, if the gene does not exist in the species, the only way then it can happen in the population is by spontaneous mutation. Any question about any of that? Let me see. We're supposed to finish this lesson. Today or not. We're getting close to the end, but we're not finished. All right. Uh, I need to briefly talk about plasmids. And plasmids are small, circular, extra chromosomal pieces of DNA. They are similar to the chromosome, meaning they are circular DNA. The difference is the chromosome contains thousands or even hundreds of thousands of genes. And the plasmid only contains a couple of genes. Yeah, we are supposed to finish chapter eight today, all right. So a plasmid is much smaller than a chromosome. Uh, plasmids just float around in the cytoplasm and they're a small piece of DNA. The plasmid does replicate independently of the cell's chromosome. And if you remember when we were talking about sexual conjugation, this plasmid replicated independently of the chromosome. Any questions about plasmids and how they differ from chromosomes? Uh, you should know that there are different types of categories of plasmids, but that's all you need to know. You don't need to know the different types of plasmids. Just know that there are different types of plasmids. Trans, a transposon is a specific region of DNA that moves from one area of DNA to another area of DNA. 
Did everyone catch that? Yep. All right. So transposons are sometimes called jumping genes because they move from one region to another. And it could be from one chromosome to another chromosome or from one region of a chromosome to another region of that same chromosome. Transposons always consist of at least two elements. They have the transposase gene that literally is an enzyme that cuts out this region of the DNA here and that region of the DNA. And then it cuts the DNA and then inserts that region, this part of DNA here. So it cuts itself out of the DNA, cuts open the DNA, and then inserts itself into the DNA and then anneals the DNA. And that's what the transposase gene does. Uh, the transposon also has on the ends of it inverted repeats. Uh, they're called inverted repeats because they repeat each other, but they are inverted from one another. And let me see if I can figure this out. TGA, TA. G, well, it's not exactly it. There it is, T-A-G, T-A-G, inverted repeats, okay? The inverted repeats have something with helping the DNA come together in the transposon and inserting into the uh, region that it wants to insert into. So all uh, transposons have this inverted repeat on both ends, and the transposase gene. And for a simple transposon, that's all it has, the transposase gene and the inverted repeats. However, a complex transposon can carry other genes in between this region. And usually the complex transposons like TN5 uh, contain this this one contains the canamycin resistance gene and then it has a transposon element right here and right there okay and then this whole region can move around in the dna uh, the importance of transposons is that regions of the chromosome can then move into a plasmid or vice versa, a plasmid can move into uh, the chromosome. And I've already mentioned that plasmids can move from one cell to another in sexual conjugation. And generally plasmids are more likely to move from one cell to another cell than the chromosome. So transposons can help uh, a cell gain existing DNA in the population, move into that cell. And then obviously transposons can allow the DNA to move around from one part in the cell to another part in the cell. That's the importance of transposons. So let me reiterate, the only way a cell can get new genetic information that doesn't exist in the population is by spontaneous mutation, which I think I've got someplace around here. No, not there. There we go. Spontaneous mutation, or I should say by a chemical or radiation mutation, by some form of radi uh, mutation. However, if the mutation exists in the population or in the species, it may move around by transformation, conjugation, and transduction. 
from one cell to another cell. And then plasmids, and then conjugation, uh, not conjugation, uh, plasmids and transposon just do the same as recombination, help shuffle, shuffle up the DNA in the population, move it around. All right, my last slide for this lesson is talking about genes and evolution. Genetic variation, if it's new, can only arise from mutation. However, a new genetic variation can move into the cell by transformation, conjugation, transduction, and then transposition, crossing over, or recombination can shuffle this new genetic variation around in the population. All of this new genetic information drives evolution of the species. And then the force that acts on that evolution is natural selection. So genetic variation resulting from mutation, a little bit from crossing over, meaning it shuffles it, transformation, conjugation, transduction, and transposition drives evolution, which is acted upon by natural selection. All right, any question about any of that? If there's no questions, then I will see you if you have any questions for the lab. There is no lab today. You do have the unknown work to work on, your unknown project to work on, but I will be in the lab from 6.30 to 6.45 to answer any questions. After 6.45, if there's no further questions, I'm then gonna log off. All right? All right, I'll see you next time.